you have to break someone to put them in human trafficking. Like you literally have to break their heart, their mind, their soul, their ego, everything. Human trafficking is stealing someone's life and their body. Human trafficking is a commercial sexual exploitation of children, of minors. It's a third party benefiting off the exchange of sex with a minor and an adult. A victim is controlled by either force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of economic exploitation. In other words, someone is using them to make money, and that could be either through forced labor or that could be through commercial sex. It's not just happening to girls, it's happening to boys. Uh, the fact that, as Brian mentioned, labor trafficking is as rampant as sex trafficking, and those aren't always exclusive. Oftentimes, they will involve both, so a labor trafficking case will also involve sexual exploitation. Exploiting the fact they didn't have a family, exploiting the fact they didn't have money, exploiting the fact that they have a low self-esteem and no one ever did share or show any love towards them. A lot of people enter into this issue by a global lens. They hear of it happening in India or Cambodia or all across Africa. And in some ways that's almost easier to compartmentalize it as, oh, I'm so sorry that happens there and what can I do to help? It's a whole nother thing to say, wow, it's happening in my neighborhood. Should I still let my kids go to the mall? What about when I go to the park? So when it gets close, it gets vulnerable for people. And that's happening all over the Bay Area, all over the country. And it has been happening for quite a while. That's human trafficking. And my story begins like a lot of people. I'm from suburbia, um, I grew up in the Bay Area. My mom had me, she was 14 going on 15 and my dad was 19. So like, it was kind of like a struggle. Like he didn't want her to have me and she had me. So it was like a distance between us. So he was there, but not mentally there. I mean, I think that I grew up on the best street in the world with the best neighbors and the best, you know, just families. We're all friends with each other. The kids were friends with each other. I think by the time I was five, my mother had a nervous breakdown, you know. Um, she would disappear on me for days on end. Um, I was left to fend for myself even at five years old. Um, then um, my parents got divorced, and like many families that I knew, even if everything looks okay, you've got a lot of kids that are lost and, and people have lost track of them, and they're trying to go to work, and now you have single parents that have their own lives they're trying to figure out. A lot of times poverty leaves you vulnerable. Coming from a home where there's not a lot of support and there's not a lot of funds, you find yourself in a place where you have to make a way. Um, and this is where I see a lot of girls start to get trapped uh, into the life. This never happened to me before. Here I'm this girl from suburbia going, what do I do? 100% of the young women I've worked with have been sexually molested. And it hasn't been by a stranger. It's been very much in the home. Our landlord, who was our, was our friend, would come over and molest me. It didn't occur to me until my adult life that that's how my mom was paying the rent, was by basically pimping me out to the landlord. I just kind of went back and forth from foster homes to foster homes and just distant and I kind of went on a suicide watch in the fifth grade um, just because my mother always would tell me that she was coming to get me and she never would. That's when I went into a group home and um, this was an all boys group home our own American children, especially those connected with the foster care system, have uh, been predisposed to really being um, potential human trafficking victims. There was this kid, he was about 16, and we just, we totally befriended each other. And I remember the first night he actually came into my room and raped me. He would do these really horrible things, and yet the next day, he was all buddy-buddy, best friends. So at the age of 14, I decided to hang out with some friends after school, and it was pretty late, um, and I decided, you know, it was time to go home. So I went to the bus stop, um, and I sat there for a while, and as I sat there, it was a car that pulled up, stopped, pulled, you know, rolled the window down, and was like, do you need a ride? And I was like, no. So he drove off. Came back around the corner, I felt a presence behind me and I turned around and it was him with the gun and he was like, get in the car. I was scared so I did what he told me to do. We drove for a while and he told me to keep my head down so you know, I wouldn't know where I was going. And one day I was, he was like, oh, you know, 
we need to, we need to go out and like, what are we gonna do? It's like, well, you know, first, you know, you gotta go in this bathroom and make some money. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, he's like, yeah, just, just go in the bathroom. You'll find some guy, you know, let him do what he wants. He'll pay you and then we can go party. Like he did like transformation pictures when the day he got me and then he fixed me up and then he did pictures of the day after he fixed me up and things like that. Sure enough, within five minutes, this older white guy walks in there. We go into a stall and uh, he sits me on the toilet and he unzips himself and he basically forces me. And what I got is what you call a, a gorilla pimp. If I do anything wrong, he'll put his hands on me. He didn't really care if it was the smallest thing, just whatever. Pulled out a few $20 bills. I'm on the floor in the, ur in the stall, lying in puke and blood. And, you know, he threw some money. He's like, I probably shouldn't pay for this. I've had better and walked out. I was told that somebody had a room and I went there to stay. I um, was drugged and raped and filmed. And I did not remember because the drugs take away your memory from the time you go to sleep to the time you wake up. From that day, he like described to me what I was supposed to do from, there, that, from that day forward, which was, you know, exchange sex with men for money. And then I was told I could not survive. I was told I would not get out. When they were done with me, they'd kill me. The, I was told not to go to the police or I would be arrested. Um, as it got bigger and bigger, I realized that every time I'd go to a hospital, to the police, the doors would be shut on me. The police, sometimes they help, like, anyway, like, sometimes they help, and sometimes they don't. Like, I, I had one where it was, he picked me up and he took me around the corner, and I, I didn't know where we were going, but I looked up, the police station was, like, right there, like, I could see it through the gate, and he was like, I'm a cop, and, you know, if you don't let me have sex with you, then I'm taking you to jail. And I let him do it, and he let me go. And he told me who the other officer was and what time they were going to be out there and, you know, be careful. And I was like, okay, and I left. Without even checking on me, he just started picking up the money and counting the money. He's like, oh, okay, cool. And he's like, okay, now we can go celebrate your birthday. You know, so this was my 11th birthday. That was, uh, that was the first time I felt like, okay, you know, this is, my life. There's no choice. Nobody wakes up and thinks I want to sell my body over and over to multiple people that I don't know for multiple prices. There's just no way you could tell me that. You think that a girl could be raped once and it turns into human trafficking now. People are not aware that most of the women on porn in pornography are trafficked and they are not even counted in the statistics. There's no regulation in the porn industry, and they make more money than ABC, CBS, and NBC all put together. Their mind and body and soul doesn't want to be there, but they have to because they have no way of leaving. If they leave, it's either death for you or for someone in your family. And there's like no way of leaving out of that unless you really have some type of help. And these exploiters are ruthless, okay? I've talked to exploiters in San Bruno County Jail and they will tell you, we get up, we get dressed, we smell good, we get the nice car, all for the purpose of going out and catching that one girl. Catching that one girl that's trailing behind the rest. Or that one girl who's kind of walking on her own or by herself or with her head down. There's definitely a recipe. And then if, when you're out in these streets and you turn on the radio and you turn on the videos and you look at the magazines, everything is telling you that it's over-sexualizing women, right? They say you're going to be a model, you're, you're going to be a star, you're going to be an actress, you're going to be this, you're going to do that, you're going to help your family. Your family's not going to ever be starving and things like that, but as soon as you get there, it's a totally different story and you're in something that you cannot get out of. The only sense of value I had was as a sex object. The only tools I had to survive at that young age was through sex. And there was no hope for a future beyond that. Especially, it hurts when you get lied to from someone that you think that's supposed to, you know, really love you and, oh, sorry. And I spent 30, 40 years of my life not ever having any dreams or hopes for the future. And it allowed me to make some very bad decisions in my life when there is no tomorrow. I 
I'm somebody who has a tomorrow now, and I have a future, and I have potential, and every day I wake up striving to live up to that full potential.